ป็นทุกวันนี้คอลัมเบียมาให้คุณกับแขกรับเชิญพีเตอร์ลอรีหนึ่งในสตรีนส์ปัจจุบันของวิทยาศาสตร์ของสังคมสังคมนี้ประกอบด้วยความมีเรื่องราวและประวัติศาสตร์ที่น่าสนใจในรายการนี้เราจะพาคุณไปสู่สถานที่ที่น่าสนใจในรายการนี้เราจะพาคุณไปสู่สถานที่ที่น่าสนใจในรายการนี้เราจะพาคุณไปสู่สถานที่ที่น่าสนใจในรายการนี้เราจะพาคุณไปสู่สถานที่ที่น่าสนใจในรายการนี้เราจะพาคุณไปสู่สถานที่ที่น่าสนใจในรายการนี้ With something dark and terrible on his mind, was it murder? And if so, can this at last be the really perfect crime? We trust that while you are wondering, we shall keep you in suspense. For suspense tonight, CBS presents "Till Death Do Us Part" by John Dixon Carr, starring Peter Lorre. Late one night in December of 1941, a man and his wife sat beside the fire in their country cottage. This man, look at him, a professor of mathematics, stout, middle-aged, guileless as a child, <laughs> in the remote corner of England where he lives with his pretty English wife. They say of him, jolly decent fellow, you know, for a foreigner, isn't he? Always a smile for everybody, and so polite. That's why it's such a shame about his wife and that young American. There hasn't been anything between them yet. I'm almost sure. But if the American stays here much longer, Shh, I tell you. Hey, man, this Professor Kraft. His cottage in the country is rather isolated, three miles from the nearest house. No electricity or central heating or telephone. And on December nights like this, a great wind comes rushing off the Sussex Downs. It rattles at the windows, growls in the chimney, and makes unsteady the oil lamp on the table. Professor Irwin Kraft sits before the fire. In a snug book-lined room, and across from him, sewing, sits his young wife Cynthia. A domestic scene, a very domestic scene. Oh, my pet, this is wonderful, isn't it? Oh, so nice and cozy. <laughs> ah, how I enjoy our little home. <laughs> It's a pleasure to be indoors on a night like this, isn't it? <laughs> Yes. Did my darling have a good day? Just about as usual. No adventures, huh? Not exactly. I walked into the village. Walked? Oh, I really blame myself for burying you out here. I ought to get your car. That's not necessary, thanks. Come now, come. Did something happen to upset my little pet today? No, no, no. You know, darling, I look at you and I marvel. You marvel at what? At a wife who can actually blush, yes, with a skin so fair and a conscience so transparent that she can actually blush. I wasn't blushing about. About what? About anything you might be thinking. <laughs> It's your horrible habit of putting everybody else in the wrong. Oh, but the neighbors don't think that about Papa Croft. The neighbors don't have to live with you. I do. And you mustn't scratch either. Not when we are so snug here, so cozy, and a kettle on the fire is nearly boiling, and the rum is ready, and the lemon juice, and the sugar for her medicine. Oh, and must I drink that stuff? I don't like rum. But you have a cold, darling. I haven't got a cold, really. I haven't. Now, darling, twice today I heard you cough. Uh, you are going to take your medicine, thank you, and take it here and now, and not offend your clumsy old husband by refusing. Why do you keep on treating me like a girl of sixteen? I love to treat you like that, Cynthia, because uh, because 
I cannot fathom your thoughts. You lock up your thoughts. And that is a dangerous English habit. You see, thoughts accumulate and won't be stifled. And sooner or later, when you least expect it... Look out, the kettle's boiling over. So it is. Oh, and please, lift it down from there. Of course, of I apologize. I apologize, my darling. There. For a second, you know, you almost frightened me. Hmm? <laughs> I frightened you? I suppose it's foolish. Well, here we are, my dear. Here we are. Now, see, I put two tumblers on the coffee table. And now, a spoon in each so that the heat doesn't crack them. Oh, dear, must you give me so much rum? Can't I have a small one? But we have to cure that cold of yours, Cynthia. <laughs> now comes the lemon juice. Yes. And now comes hot water to the clock. <laughs> Here we are. And two lumps of sugar for each of us. There you are, darling. Now let's drink up, huh? Owen. Listen. I didn't hear anything. I did. It it came from that cupboard over there. It sounded like your recording. Oh, that's nonsense, darling. That's nonsense. There. There it is again. Well, that's only the wind. Or or perhaps a rat that got into the cupboard. Oh, and I'm terrified of rats. Go and kill it. Would you mind? Oh, you really sit very heavy labors, my sweet, for one of my weight. Well, well, if you insist, all right. Well, well I'll take a good heavy poker from the fireplace. And, of course, it means a little trip through the cupboard. Oh, and uh, never mind. You haven't changed your mind, have you? It would probably run out across the floor. Come back. Wouldn't run very far, I'm sure. Well, <laughs> again, if you insist. I can't think what's the matter with me tonight. No? No. You're sure nothing upset you in the village today, huh? Certainly not. How about uh, this young American, that uh, fledgling doctor, what's his name? You mean Dr. Craig? That's it, Dr. Craig. Dr. Craig. Didn't someone say he was leaving today for London and, and then back to the States? I believe so. Uh, that's what Lady Randolph told me. And you didn't say goodbye to him? Certainly not. Well, that wasn't kind of you, darling. That wasn't friendly. What's the matter? Don't you like my nice hot rum drink? No. But you'll give me no peace till I do drink it. That's right, darling. That's right. Now, take it down like a good girl. I'm keeping you company. See? Oh, how pretty she looks with her yellow hair in the firelight and her red mouth and her light little hands. Very pretty. Oh, uh, there is just one other thing, Cynthia. I, I gave you a letter to post this afternoon. Did you post it? Yes. Registered? Yes. And uh, did you notice whom the letter was addressed? Everybody notices the address on an envelope. It was to... Mr. Hatterby at Market Shepherd. That's right. But I don't know who he is, if that's what you mean. Oh, Mr. Hatterby is uh, the coroner of this district. The coroner? That's right. That's right. But uh, is there any reason why you should be writing letters to the coroner? Well, <laughs> there will be tomorrow morning. We have been just drinking poison, my love. Why do you drop your glass on me? <laughs> I don't believe you. No? <laughs> uh, this would interest you, Cynthia. You were a trained nurse, and weren't you? Uh... You see, the poison was aconite. Mum shoes. No. Yes, homegrown in our own little garden. You know, one sixteenth of a grain has been a fatal dose. This is California. No car, not even a neighbor. Exactly, my angel. Take your hands off me. Let me get up. No, my pet. In about five minutes, you see, the the first symptoms will come on. Symptoms? Yes. Our throat will go dry. <laughs> our eyesight will turn dim. No. And presently, we'll lose the use of our limbs. Well, there are convulsions before the <laughs> end, I believe, but you won't feel them. 
Let me help. If if you try to hit at me, Angel, you'll upset that lamp. And, well, if you upset the lamp, this cottage would go up like tinder. We don't want to burn to death, do we? Oh, and why are you doing this? Why are you doing it? Why? Do you think all Papa Kraft is blind, my pet? Huh? If I can't have you, Cynthia, nobody else is going to have you. You mean Jim Craig? <laughs> so it is Jim Craig. Oh, that was nothing. My tongue slipped. A cynic would say, my dear, that your foot slipped. Do you think I don't know what happened the other night at the schoolhouse? The schoolhouse? Yes, the Market Shepherd Schoolhouse. At Lady Randolph's little concert in aid of the war relief. Nothing happened, I swear it didn't. No? No. Oh, then it was coincidence, I suppose, that you and that Dr. Craig didn't arrive until the concert was nearly over. Yes. Yes, it was. We didn't go there together. No? We met in the little hall outside the auditorium. It was just as you were finishing your number on the accordion. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh. It's so dark, sure I almost bumped into you. Isn't that Mrs. Craig? Yes. Good evening, Dr. Craig. We... We seem to be late. Very late, I'm afraid. I... I was detained on a case. Um, I didn't feel like coming here at all. Oh, just a moment before I open that door for you. Won't it look a little funny, our arriving here together? Funny? Why should it? No reason at all, only... Cynthia, listen to me. You know, Dr. Craig, that's the first time you've ever called me by my first name. I did want to have a word with you somehow. Of course, you've heard the news. What news? Well, on the radio for the past couple of days. Oh, we're too far out to get much news, and my husband isn't interested. He isn't interested? He isn't interested in anything but himself. Father, you didn't talk that way about my husband. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you push the door open a little? And in conclusion, Lady Randolph is saying something. I'm sure we've all enjoyed our friend Professor Croft's musical numbers on the accordion. <laughs> and the vicar's conjuring trick. <laughs> and little Miss Linshaw's spirited recitation. It only remains for me to tell you that the collection for this little entertainment will amount to the... But yes, Colonel Thompson, what is it? Colonel Thompson's going across the platform in rather a hurry. Looks like an announcement of some kind. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention. We have just received some late news by the 9 o'clock bulletin. I think I can guess what it is. Following yesterday's declaration against Japan, the Congress of the United States today declared war against Germany and Italy. No applause, please. I think I can say that these things go too deep for applause. We entered a war lightly, and we have learned. But before the vicar ends this meeting, I shall ask the orchestra to play us the song numbered 83 in the book, a song we know is dear to the hearts of all Americans. <laughs> Naturally, it does. You won't be leaving England. Probably in a very short time. I'll be needing doctors. But does a formal declaration of war make any difference? What does it mean to you? What does it mean? I, I can't explain it, Cynthia. And following that song, if they're going to need me, I'll go back. But can't you do just as much good here in England? I don't know. That depends on what the army says. And doesn't anything depend on what I say? We haven't got much time, Cynthia. That, that card will be out in a minute. Yes. And we won't admit it, will we? Admit what? Admit how we feel about each other. I haven't said... Nor I. I was only talking about what we were thinking. No, we won't admit it. You say you can't explain about the war. I can't explain about this. Don't try. It's better this way. Erwin's been very good to me. He's such a childlike person. Yes. A 
everybody likes him. Oh, he has his temper. It's not easy to live with sometimes, in spite of what they think. But I can't do anything to hurt him, because he'd never do anything to hurt me. Never, never, never in the world. fair estimate of my character, too. That's exactly what I said about you. So you are in love with that fellow? I admit it now. Yes. Tell me, darling, do you feel anything yet? Feel anything? I mean, uh, dryness? Muscular contraction of the throat? Yes. Oh, I thought so. I won't die. And I won't. And how do you propose to stop yourself? Your only chance would be to reach the village infirmary. And I'll see to it that you don't get there. But what if the poison takes you before it takes me? Then you can't stop me. But it won't, darling. You seem terribly sure of that. You see, the amount I gave you, as you perhaps noticed, was more than I gave myself. I'm going to follow you, my little pet, into the dark, where there are no Dr. Jim Craig's. But not too quickly. I shall still have most of my faculties, Cynthia, when your convulsions are already beginning. Oh. I wonder if you will. Why do you say that? Your legs don't seem any too steady. Ah, I don't know. It must be the heat of uh, the fire, perhaps, or it's very hot in this room. Cynthia, Cynthia, darling, listen to me. Yes, Irwin? The... There is a copy of, uh, of Taylor's medical jurisprudence on the, there, over on the shelf there. Please, uh, please get it for me. I'm afraid you'll have to get it for yourself, my dear. That is, if you can. Oh, uh, I'll get it. Uh, uh, Mind the lamp, Irwin. We don't want the house afire, just as you said yourself. I'll mind the lamp. Uh, listen to me. You know, some people's systems aren't tolerant to poisons. The, the experience in minutes would ought to take hours. Does it hurt, Evan? Does it hurt? Oh, yes. But you'll find out soon enough, my pet. Because, because you'll never make three miles to the village. Never. You think it's not? I know it. And, and just remember, I, I shall be waiting. Waiting? Out in the dark and cold, where there is neither marriage nor giving in in marriage. I'll be waiting for my little pet to come and join me. you to die because of me. And, and yet, you are dead, Irwin. But I'm not going to join you. I've never prayed much, Irwin, but I'm praying now. Whatever comes over my wits and makes my senses weak, give me strength enough to get to the village. Just give me strength enough to get to the village. An empty room now, except for the motionless figure by the fire. The great wind enters through an open front door and makes the lamp shake dangerously on the tables. The whole house creaks. Otherwise, it is very quiet. Suddenly, the corpse sits up. Professor Kraft looks pleased, doesn't he? Very pleased very alert, 
as he moves over to a certain cupboard door. <laughs> well, and now I think the real fun can begin. <laughs> patience, 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 my friend, while I open the cupboard door. <laughs> well, there we are. I hope you haven't been too uncomfortable, Dr. James Craig. I'm all right, thanks. So you managed to get the gag out of your mouth, huh? I managed it, yes, just now. <laughs> I'm too late. Well, you are still securely tied up, I'm glad to say. You know, you gave me several very, very unpleasant moments, young man, when you when you got your foot on that accordion. Did I? Well, Cynthia thought you were a rat and wanted me to kill you. You know, she shows very good sense sometimes. I could hear both of you talking. Thanks very much. Oh, of course, you could, of course. Excuse me, please. I, I forgot that. Yes, and I could see you, too, through a crack in the door. Well, you were intended to see us. But now, come on. First of all, I'll drag you out of here. Yes, now, let me take you. Yes. Now we can sit down and have a nice, cozy little chat. Huh? How much aconite did you give Cynthia? How much? Oh, about uh, two grains. Two, two grains? Well, then she can't possibly... No, she can't possibly live until morning. But she can live long enough to testify that she saw me die. And how much poison did you take yourself? I? None. None at all? No. None at all. <laughs> but you mixed those drinks out of the same materials I saw you do it. Well, but there wasn't any poison in the room, young man. You see, two lumps of sugar steeped in aconite were dropped into Cynthia's glass. I marked them, and I didn't make a mistake. <laughs> Can you see the beginnings of Papa Croft's plan? Why, you... You see, uh, Cynthia left the door open, my friend. And there is a very strong wind blowing tonight. Well? Just observe how it lifts the table covers, flutters the magazines, makes the lamp tremble. I shouldn't be surprised, you know, if... Uh, if one of those lamps blew over, a fine crash in a sheet of flame, huh? <laughs> and when they come here tomorrow morning, after Cynthia's testimony in my letter to the coroner, they'll expect to find at least a, at least a few charred bones among the ruins. And of course, they must find some remains. Whose remains? Yours. Yes, you've got me tied up pretty well, haven't you? And now, you see... <laughs> now comes the best. You were last seen going towards the railway station, to London, and then to America. Nobody, nobody will inquire after you. Except Cynthia. That's right, except Cynthia, who will be dead. That I waylaid you and brought you here while Cynthia was in the village will not be known to our good coroner, and I shall disappear. What do you think of it, young man, huh? I think it's rather good, huh? You're, you're going to let me burn to death? Yes, and I shall enjoy the necessity. By the way, too bad you missed my performance at Lady Randall's concert. It was very nice, but uh, then I think you were otherwise occupied. You could call it that? Occupied, I think, in making love to my wife. You hurt my vanity, young man. And you are going to suffer for it. I've never made love to your wife. No? No. But I don't suppose you could possibly believe that. Are you already begging for mercy? Now, come on, now, come on. Are you begging for mercy? No, I think not. Dr. Craig, I don't like the way you're taking this. I really don't. Don't you? No. You ought to be afraid. All decent men should be afraid. And no man is heroic when he sees death coming. But you are as white as a plate. You can't take your eyes off me. And seem to be expecting something. Maybe I am expecting something. You are? Well, <laughs> I think I can persuade you to tell me what's on your mind, my friend. If I use the poker out of the fire, huh? You see, you see, I'm a mathematician. I leave nothing to chance. 
Do you hear that, Professor Kraft? A car has stopped out in front. Well, they won't come in here. But of course they will. It's probably the home guard. Look, you fool, you've left the front door standing wide open in a blackout. Don't be childish. Do you think to upset me with that? Something's upset you. Take a look at yourself in a mirror. Hmm? Nothing. Nothing can upset my plans now. Everything is ready. My clothes and my money are in the stable. This place, this pretty little cottage, will be a furnace. All I have to do is... <laughs> All I have to do is pick up that lamp. You see? Like this and... Uh... Something is wrong with me! Oh, you're not acting this time, are you? You're not pretending now. You! You swine! What have you done to me? I have done that. You! You have done something to me! I... I can feel it! There... There is sweat all over me! My... My throat! Choking! You say that, Angel. You the past. That... That sounded like... Not my wife's voice. It was Cynthia's voice. What is wrong with you? A person would think you were drunk. I'm sorry, Lady Glanville. Stopping me in the road and asking to be taken to the infirmary, 80 miles an hour, and then finding there was nothing wrong with you. Oh, but but it can be. It isn't possible. Oh, but it is. You see, your plans didn't include the fact that Cynthia doesn't like rum. Mm. Remember. You poured a very large drink for her and a small one for yourself. And you filled both glasses with hot water. Oh, remember when she got, got you to leave her and come over to this cupboard? She changed the glasses then. You're the one who swallowed the poison. Two grains of aconite. No. Help me. Please. Help me. Nothing on earth can save you. Help me, please. In the name of... Please, please. Please help me. Nothing on earth can save you. Please. No. You won't. <laughs> then. Then I'll show you. I'll. I'll take you with me. <laughs> I'll take everybody with me. Where are you going? I'll. I'll get that lamp. <laughs> I'll take you with me. I look at you. You can't even uh, see. You're blind. Uh, You're staggering straight into that cupboard. Uh, I'll take you. I'll take you with me. <laughs> I'll be all. Jim. Jim, what are you doing here? Come in, Cynthia. Come in and take a look at the man who... Died twice. And so ends Till Death Do Us Part, starring Peter Lorre. Tonight's story of Suspect. Columbia presents these tales of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next Tuesday, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. Mr. Laurie was starred as Professor Kraft. He was supported by Alice Frost as Cynthia, David Gothard as Dr. Craig, and Mercedes McCambridge as Lady Randolph. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer, conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on... Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>